So I said to her, this is how the conversation went. We get married and she's like, okay, I heard we're supposed to take our wedding money and invest it. And I say to her, I'm like, I've been working for a number of years. I've already invested most of that. Don't worry. I'll, I'll take care of this. Yeah. And the truth was, is I take that money and I invest it into sports cards <laughs> and I roll, and I roll that money hard into the... <laughs> Hello, 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 and welcome to the Neighborhood Money Podcast, a video podcast where we talk about personal finance, entrepreneurship, and helping you build the life you deserve. If you're new here to the neighborhood, welcome. My name is Kevin Stackpool, and I'm one of your co-hosts of the Neighborhood Money Podcast. My other co-host, Andrew Nori, is actually out on assignment today, so he's not going to be joining me in the intro and later on in the episode, but he was a part of the conversation that we're bringing you all today. And actually, that conversation, I am so excited to get in front of you all because we are welcoming on Arya Scheinbein, who basically is a business and investing wealth guru, for lack of a better phrase. He has so much experience that he brings to the table. And our conversation with Arie is so fascinating. We touch on a whole host of topics. We talk about business, getting started and truly facing your fears when starting your own business or going into entrepreneurship. We talk about getting started and investing and what you should think about. And actually, is does it make sense still to invest in an employer-sponsored 401k? But I think the thing that I'm most excited about because it's so fascinating is his story with selling and flipping baseball cards and actually how he was able to take his side hustle, his hobby, and make enough money to put a down payment on his house for him and his wife. So make sure you stick around for the entire episode because there are so many great nuggets and good takeaways that I'm hoping that you all can take into your own day-to-day and implement into your personal finance life. But you know, that's enough for me. Without further ado, let's welcome Arya Scheinbein into the neighborhood. Joining us this week in the neighborhood is Arya Scheinbein, a wealth architect who helps business owners and entrepreneurs invest their money intelligently so that they can focus on growing their business. He also has worked at some of the best companies and investment management firms in the world, and he's also the host of Inside the Lion's Den podcast, an Apple podcast, top 100 podcast, and it's a show that explores the leadership skills, financial acumen, and operational improvements required for sustained entrepreneurial and financial success. All right. So excited for you to join us here in the Neighborhood Studio today to talk really about anything from business to investing and maybe even some sports cards memorabilia stuff along the way. Uh, But very happy to have you join Drew and myself here today. How's it going? Thanks so much for having me. It is going well. Thanks. Let's just jump right into it off the bat. So Drew and I noticed that you at one point in time, and maybe you still are, were into sports cards and memorabilia as a side hustle. And trust me, Drew and I, we love us some side hustles. So can you kind of walk us through what that looked like? And was that really your segue or foray into the personal finance space? Or how did you really get into the sports cards and memorabilia world? Yeah. So interestingly, um, I got into the sports card world when I was a kid and I didn't even realize like, so I, my, my path, I'll, I'll kind of give the path and then jump back to the sports cars and it'll kind of all make a lot more sense. So when, you know, went to school, high school, my parents like, you know, you got to go to college, get a degree, get a good job, da, da, da. Right. So like I did that, went to college, really pivoted. Like I thought I was going to be a lawyer freshman year. I'm like, I am going to law. You see the movies, you see the TV shows. You're like, yes. And like freshman year, I have his professor and he's like, do you like reading? And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I like reading. He's like, a lot. The same thing. <laughs> do you like doing the same thing over and over? And I'm like, no, what, what are you talking about? And so yeah. it turns out like he had gone to Columbia Law School and he didn't become a, a law, lawyer. And he basically showed me why I'm going to hate being a lawyer. Um, and you know, not to knock any lawyers who are listening, but he basically kind of said, if you're not this or you don't want that, you're going to, you know, you're not going to love it. And so I pivoted to finance and business just came naturally to me. 
And so I went into finance, went to Wall Street, went into investment banking and, and investing in um, you know different companies, buying and sell, working with companies to how to buy and sell, finance them. Then got into early stage uh, investing that I was working at a VC firm, and then ultimately spent the rest of my you know professional career in hedge funds or private equity firms. But kind of to take the story back, right? I didn't realize a couple of things when I graduated. Number one is how naturally business came to me. I kind of just took it for granted because like you never know, you only know what's in your brain, right? Like you have no idea mm-hmm. what anybody else is really ever thinking and you don't know what they're experiencing. And so I remember when I was a kid, I actually, when I was probably like 12 or 13, I was really, really into sports cards. Now I love to play sports, but I loved sports cards even probably as much as playing ball. And I would watch a player and say, okay, like, so this rookie is doing really, really well. Now, when I was a kid, I'm going to date and age myself here. The internet price guides didn't exist. The internet <laughs> wasn't a thing. Sure. And so yep. it was like Beckett Sports Cards was the, 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 the pricing guide, and it would come out once a month. But if you think about that, like just from an arbitrage or just like a, a, a random kind of thing, there's no market. For 30 days, you have a stale market, right? Like this, this guide comes out, and then for the next 30 days, the price is basically fixed, based on what the guide says. Because mm-hmm, if you went sure. to a store or if you went uh, you know, to a card show or you went whatever, that was the benchmark that everybody used. Like, okay, I will, like a store would sell it for let's say book value and they would buy it for let's say half book. That was like the, the, the common thing. And so I would go to these shows and because I was so into the, the players, if, if there was a hot rookie, so let's just make up numbers, like the card is worth five bucks, okay? Mm-hmm. Price guide says five dollars, but I know over the last two weeks, he's like gone on a tear. He's hit five home runs in in three games or whatever it is, right? I'm like, there is no way when that guide comes out next month in two weeks from now that that doesn't gonna have this little triangle that says up, and it's not gonna be an eight dollar <laughs> card or a ten dollar yeah. card. Like it's just not possible. And so I would start accumulating as the player would perform, and. I would go to the shows and I would start to, you know, to accumulate the cards. And I remember one time this guy, the way they used, you know, a lot of times they have like the, the expensive cards up front, like in the, the high, you know, value cases or, or the grading. And back then grading wasn't anywhere near what it is today. But then they would have like, you know, the, the albums, which have like nine slots. And what they would do is like the middle slot, they would take out and they put the price sheet and basically like, you know, tell you what every card was. Or if it was the same card, it would just be like one price. And I remember there was a rookie and it said like a dollar. And I knew the card was already like at five and it was heading to mm-hmm. 10, not a question. So I said, I'll take, I'll take those. And he's like, oh, you want one? I'm like, no, I'll take all eight. And my dad was kind of like hovering in the back. Like he wasn't hovering on the table. He was like floating around and whatever. And, um, the guy, as soon as I, a kid, said, I want all eight, you know, his antennas went up like, hmm, do I know I will all, do I have all the correct information, right? You yeah. know, like, yeah. and um, so he immediately opens a guide and he sees it's like three bucks, five bucks, whatever the number is, right? And he's like, oh, that's a mistake. And like, out of nowhere, my dad whoo, comes in and he's like, don't you change the price on him just because yeah. he's a kid, da, 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 <laughs> yeah. right? So like I walk away with all eight cards, right? And by the next month, the thing's like 10 bucks and I'm like, woohoo, you know, like I made 10X on my money on like eight cards, right? But um, I kept most of those cards and, and I really loved it. But when I graduated, like there was no such thing as an entrepreneur. Like the, the idea of like working for yourself was like not even common, but the idea of like doing something and staying in, in like sports cars as a profession, like that I wouldn't say that seemed absurd, but it was not like a commonly acceptable thing. And so fast forward, I go to college, go to finance, and I'm working for a couple of years. And what happens is, is that um, I take a lunch break one day and I'm just walking the neighborhood, New York City, and I kind of stumble upon this sports card store. And I'm like, ah, oh, the nostalgia, right? Like I haven't, I haven't right. like collected cards in forever. And I so you had in. to walk in. <laughs> yeah, I totally had to walk in. It was con- like, and I wasn't so into comic books, but like I had some, I had some like, you know, valuable ones. And like, so I go, it's a huge comic book and it's figurines, but he's got like all the sports cards and I go up and, um, I'm like, oh, how much is a pack of cards? Right. Like total, like almost like novice question. And he's like, which one? And like, okay, so the expansion of like, you know, product lines had been like astronomical in the, in these years that I had kind of disappeared from the hobby. And I'm like, I, I don't know, like that one. And he's like, $5. I'm 
I'm like startled, right? Like when I was a kid, it was like 50 cents, I don't know, a buck or yeah. something, you know? Like, <laughs> so I'm like, how many cars are in that pack? <laughs> you know? And he's like, he's like five. And I'm like, yeah. five cars for five dollars? Like, what's in there? Like I said to him, I'm like, what's in there? And he goes, you don't know what's in there? And I'm like, I don't know. And he says, well, this, these packs, have every, every pack is a card with, you know, a bat. I'm like, come again, what? And he shows me, like, he, you know, we go to the display case of all the high-end stuff. I'm like, this is the coolest thing. Like, as, as, a, as a sports fan, this is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Right? And he's like, their serial number, their autograph, their, they have the patches of their jerseys. I'm like, <gasps> yeah. like, I'm in love, right? Like, I'm yeah, like, yeah. and so I'm like, okay, how much is a box of, of, you know, of these packs? And he's like, it's $120. In my head, like I'm like I make good money, right? Like I'm in a high-paying job, but I'm like, that seems ridiculously overpriced, yeah. you know? Like for playing cards, right? Yeah, and so like I'm like, okay, and I leave. Like yeah, I spend some time there and I leave. I go back to the office, I like hop on eBay, and I'm like, you know, I put in like that type. I'm like, how much is this thing? You know, like and I find the the box of cards for sixty bucks, and I'm like, your juices were flowing again. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, huh. So then I hop over to Yahoo Auctions because that's like the, the number two place at that time. Okay. And, um, and they're going for like 85 to 105. And I'm like, huh. So I immediately start – like that night I go home. So I'm, um, I'm actually married at this point and we're actually expecting our first child. And my wife, when, when she was expecting the first child, she was out cold by like eight, nine o'clock, the absolute latest, right? So I come home like I'm this young guy – And like, she's out cold. Like, what am I going to do? So what do I do? I hop online and I start like buying boxes of cards on eBay and taking ownership of them and then listing them on Yahoo and then reselling them for like, you know, making like whatever, 30, $50 a box. And then I start listing, you know, posting them locally. Does anyone, you know, like basically just undercutting the stores just a little bit, you know, like, and and it starts going. And now all of a sudden packages start showing up every day. Mass packages, package, packages. So I'm like, oh, this is not going to go well. Like I, yeah. I already know. Like like too too much space in the apartment. So I start I got to ask. Wife is, I like, is, is there a part of you I don't know? Or <laughs> <laughs> I was going to so say, where are all these boxes? Know what, does your wife know at this time that you're buying these boxes of cards? So I said to her, this is how the conversation went. We get married. And she's like, okay, I heard we're supposed to take our wedding money and invest it. And I say to her, I'm like, I've been working for a number of years. I've already invested most of that. Don't worry. I'll I'll take care of this. Yeah. And the truth was is I take that money and I invest it into sports cards. And I roll <laughs> and I roll that money hard into like within two years we have our first home. And like like that's the down payment. Like I literally like rolled that money. And wow. And it was, um, it was great. It was, it was like an awesome experience, but I stopped sending it to the ha- the apartment. I started sending it to mm-hmm. the office. Then it got a little oh, out okay. of hand at the, at the office too, because I realized, um, why should I, why should I actually take ownership of the box? I should have the seller just sit on it. And when I mm-hmm. resell it, he'll send it to my new, my, my new buyer. Oh, I'll sure. So it's like drop shipping, you know, but before yeah, drop shipping was the thing. Drop your- yeah. And, but that's when I'm like, this is so inefficient. There has to be a better way. And so that's when I started buying it by, you know, so the packs come singly, but you sell it by the box. But so I started buying the cases, which have, let's say, 12 boxes, 12 sealed boxes in it. So I started buying by the case. And that's when I started shipping to the office. And like literally UPS, the, the UPS man would like crack up because like I have, I have this office in the investment firm and he's bringing in like cases of sports cards like daily. And like, <laughs> I'm like boxing it up like, and I'd put it on the side and he would come and take the stuff the next day, all my shipments, you know, whatever. And yeah. so then I started buying it wholesale. And, and like I really got into it and I really learned a lot. And then we ended up buying a house. Um, but I ultimately, the, the card market at that point started to crash. There was mm. too much you know, in the eighties, they, they, the printing presses just ran like tops only had mm-hmm. one thing. And even when upper deck came out, they only had one product. But by, by this point, when I like, this is early two thousands, this was, you know, there was, there was tops that had Bowman as well. And so there was, there was Chrome, there was elite, there was who the heck knows what, like a Donruss and Fleer and upper deck. Each one had like eight variations. So on a, a single baseball season, like as a sports card collector, you're trying to collect like 24 different 
you know, variance of one player, it, it got too much. And so the supply in the market really like crashed it coupled with, you know, we went through the United States, went through a recession from like 01 to 04. So it was just mm-hmm. a big messy time. Thankfully I had bailed, um, from that. But what I found then is I pivoted into other e-commerce brands, uh, in e-commerce businesses. And it was the same thing for me. It always was just like being able to find saying I could buy it X and sell it for two X or sell it for three X or whatever it was. And it was just a data thing. It was a matter of like understanding the analytics and looking at it and, it wasn't per se because my career professionally was teaching me all this investing stuff. It was just like, it came, I don't know, I felt like very natural. And, and even to this day, like I still have a couple of e-commerce businesses, but it's just a function of like looking at the data, looking at where sales trends are going, understanding what the buyer wants. And it kind of, you know, side hustles weren't a thing, but it was my thing, right? And um, it also kind of taught me into a lot of like online marketing and, and email marketing, all these mm-hmm. kinds of things like back then, because I realized like, huh, I kind of need to be able to reach my customers. When you moved on from the trading cards, your next mm-hmm. products and brands that you went to, were they yeah. products and brands that you knew a lot about? Or when you're saying just data stuff, you just looked at just random products and then yes. just filled so your this online was, store with them. Yeah. So what happened again, this is like pre Shopify. This is like mm-hmm. eBay is the king, right? And yep. um, in the beginning, I started with things I knew nothing about, not even brands that like when I got into Amazon, when Amazon created um, the ability to sell things like they, they were later to the game. So I'll, I, I could talk mm-hmm. through that a little bit, but like when, that when I was on eBay, before even before FBA, oh, they even opened that. it up. Yeah, so I got into FBA as soon as they opened that was like 2011. But before sure. FBA, they only allowed you to sell books or DVDs. And I'll, I'll tell you a DVD story in a second. But the eBay, I knew nothing about these products other than it was very clear they were selling a lot of them. And, okay. and I was buying hunting and fishing equipment that I did not hunt. I did not fish. I didn't do any of these things, but I could tell based on the information that was available that Mm -hmm. a lot of these were selling. So I just went, found the supplier and just did the same exact thing. Because back then, you could actually advertise your listing on the front page of ebay.com. It would rotate through your, let's say it was a seven day auction, you would pay Mm -hmm. like a hundred bucks in ad spend and it would rotate, you'd probably get one to two times but when wow. those hit, boop, 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 like the number of sales that went through, yeah, um, there was a lot of things back then. But anyway, with with regard to Amazon, what actually reinforced that I was just naturally like this came naturally was um, because there was only DVDs. I would buy back then. Disney would release, let's say, you know, Beauty and the Beast, Sleeping Beauty, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. The way they did it was it would be available for 30 to maybe 90 days in the stores. And then they would what they would do is they, they would pull it back into the vault, meaning you couldn't find mm-hmm. it anywhere. And so yep. at first I didn't like think anything of it. I had actually, my, my eldest was a girl, so we would buy these things. And then I was like, oh, wait a second, like it's gone? Like you can't get this again? So I kind of caught like the tail end of one of the princess ones. I don't remember which one it was. Oh, it was like Snow White. I remember I caught like the tail end of the Snow White and so I, I bought like five or ten of them, and I waited a few months. It, it went back into the vault, and I started listing them on, on Amazon. And I, like I paid, let's say, twenty dollars retail, and people were paying forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty dollars for this thing. So I'm oh, like, sure, huh, okay, this makes sense. So the next release was like either Cinderella or Sleepy Beauty. I, I backed up the truck. I'm like, okay, we're just like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, and and I'm like, I'm just your wife's buy like, it. here he is again. <laughs> yeah, she literally, she's like, I don't want to see those. Like, you better put them somewhere that I don't have to see. And they Office don't, they can't take up. Some, yeah, and like, we're living in a four bedroom house, so it's nice. I'm like, okay, and like, I at the time, you know, we probably had like two kids. Like now we have four, but at the time we had like two. So like, where was an extra bedroom? I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> like putting this stuff. And I remember, <laughs> I think it was the next one. So the, the second one, I, I was a little bit concerned. So I only bought, let's say, 100 of them or 150 of them. And like I really wanted to sell them during the holidays. And when that worked out so well, I'm like, okay, the next, whatever the next princess is, I'm just going to really go after this. 
And that one, they left out of the vault for a lot longer. I don't know what happened. And I was like, huh, not really sure what to do now. I'm not going to dump Anybody want to watch a movie? <laughs> so I actually doubled down. I'm like, oh, wow. you know what? Like people were starting to, you know, people were like panicking and dumping the stuff. And like, I was like, okay, I'm just going to start buying that. I started buying them at, at like $11 and $9. But I, mm-hmm. I had to wait a full year, a full year that I was like invested in this. But I looked at this mm-hmm. as my non-publicly traded investment vehicle, right? Like it wasn't stocks sure. where I didn't control. I controlled the process. And in the end, I probably sold most of those close to $60. So it was, it was a weight game, but it worked. Um, and so, yeah, like, I mean, sports cars, I still like, I've dabbled in it since. Cause like when Gary V made them cool again, it became like a whole right. other thing. Yep. The one thing I will say is, um, there was a time when I was doing the sports cards that like, when I was a little kid, I used to, I used to write letters to all the players and I would send them either a card or just write them a letter. And then some would send me back signed things some would just send me an eight by ten photo some would send me whatever um one player i remember i i would even i would include like (laughs) because i didn't put a a prepaid postage stamp in i include like a quarter or like whatever it was for the postage they could send me my card back one player (laughs) i remember he sent he autographed my card sent it back and he even taped back my money like sending it back to me it's like um and so I was into, I liked the concept of autographs, but yeah. my parents were like, unless you want to spend your money on this, like, and I was making money in cards. They're like, you cannot buy autographs. That's like a stupid thing to buy. Like I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember though, like when I was finally like an adult, I like, I went and bought like a Mickey Mantle ball, um, a Cal Ripken autograph ball. Like, so I have a bunch of autographs, but to this yep. day, I haven't like really dove in because it lost it became like it wasn't sentimental to me anymore. Mm. It was just like sure. you know, but but there are you know some people are really into autographs as well. Yeah, for sure. You, you know what's pretty amazing is bringing up Gary V and the playing cards, how they kind of just tanked, and you couldn't believe each card was worth like a dollar when you first went back and was checking it out, and then now with the market getting into those nfts where everybody looks at them says those things are worth nothing i can just screenshot them but it's amazing like collectibles and what people put value towards and during when the the, if there's a bubble or in the market's hot it's hot yeah it's interesting because like i i think he he has a lot of ability he has a, a really keen ability to kind of see a trend way ahead of its time now he's been wrong mm-hmm. like i'm not gonna say the guy's always right but and he's also yeah. on a roll right like he's been hot a lot for sure yeah but the way he broke down the concept of the nft actually because when when, when top shots came out right like whatever it was like early 21 or late 2020 i'm like yeah. that makes no sense to me right i'm like even as a sports car collector i'm just like that doesn't make any sense like I can watch that video on YouTube. What do I need? Like, wh- where's the value in that? And so after listening to him and talking to some other people, they're like, listen, you don't need a million people to want this. You just need one, right? Like you need one person to have, to place a higher value on this thing than you. And if you, and then I thought about it and I think he explained it or someone else was explaining it. Basically, it's almost like the intellectual property or the goodwill. Like when you, when you buy Air Force Ones, right? So it costs them 20 bucks to make it, 5 bucks to make it, whatever the heck it makes it, right? So like retail price is $90, but then they do something special to it and it's $120, but then you don't get it on the drop and now it's a limited edition and next thing you know, you're paying $300 or $500 if you're into kicks, right? What are you really paying for, right? Like it's conceptually, it's the same thing on the NFT market, but what he's done is he's gone and he's made a utilization, right? Like he's made utility of yep. this thing, right? Like, okay, you can come to my conference for the next three years, or you can get royalties from my book or whatever it is, right? And so he's actually made it much more like understandable. And and so like Disney's released some NFTs that they're really just collectibles. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not a buyer of that. Like I don't, I don't see the value, but I see how a business could totally use the smart contract and utility around it. Like, so like some of these projects, who the heck knows, right? Like, you know, I, I, I remember I was having a conversation with my, my 12 year old and she's like, so I don't understand the NFT. 
And I said, oh, I was having, it was my 12 and 15 year old. And I said, you know, like when you play Roblox and you have like this limited edition, whatever crown in your, your girl dress up game. She's like, yeah. And like people come and they see your, your, in, your whatever you have in your inventory and they want to trade with you. And uh, she's like, yeah, I'm like, that's what it is. It's a digital asset that somebody else wants or they value for it's limited. And then my 15 year old, I said, you know, think about your skins in your Fortnite game, right? Like you're playing Fortnite and, and you got like the OG skin and like, ah, oh, whatever. I'm like, and you kind of use it as like, a, it's it's like an online flex, right? Like a, yeah, it's, sure. it's a yeah, T-flex. Social yeah, right? status you, symbol, something like correct. that. And, and so now like cyberpunks, you know, I don't know that community super well, but there's definitely a flex aspect of a lot of these things, right? It's like, you know, the guy yeah, who wears the Rolex. You started to see a lot of the businesses too. Like some are coming out with, uh, I know there's a high-end dinner club where you can buy an NFT and it gets you access to this high-end meal. Uh, I yep. think Gary Vee actually might be a part of it. I, and I don't actually remember the name of the, of the company itself, but the utility is far beyond just JPEGs on the internet. Uh, so all right, let's, let's kind of dive into your podcast. So inside the lion's den, uh, you kind of are culminating all the information, all the education, the knowledge that you've built um, over the course of your working career, whether that's with sports cards and memorabilia or working for an investment firm. Uh, but your podcast really helps people do a variety of things, but most notably, you know, starting and growing a business. Uh, and you do that in a variety of different ways through interviews and just conversations with your audience. But one thing, you know, that I think a lot of people struggle with is the fact of just getting started with a business. It's probably one of the biggest barriers that one might have if trying to go into entrepreneurship. It's do they even understand entrepreneurship or um, are they even willing to like take that next step? And there's a variety of reasons why they might be, you know, there might be fear, there might be some self doubt, but do you have any tips for our listeners that may be considering entrepreneurship or business and how to overcome some of that anxiety of fear and self doubt? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, like I, I will say, no matter how good you are at something, no matter how big of an expert, anyone who says, oh, I never doubt myself or, oh, I don't have the imposter syndrome or whatever, like they're not telling you the truth. Like no matter who it is, e even, even the players sure. in the NBA, yeah. right? Like they get jitters before that game, right? They find ways to, to cope with it. But, you know, they practice day in and day out. They definitely, as they step on the stage, there are some jitters. So you have to know that that's normal and that's natural. Um, the Depending on your age and depending on where you are and what you're trying to accomplish here, obviously this is going to vary a little bit. But the first thing I tell people is, like, it's really okay to embrace the suck. You're not going to be good at something in the beginning. And it doesn't make you any less than and it doesn't make you a failure. And, and I use my podcast as a perfect example. When I, I have no problem speaking to, you know, boardrooms full of executives. I've spoken on stage, 500 people. I'm totally good. I kind of like bullet point out and I, I don't, you know, like list out what I'm going to talk and it's pretty free flow. When I started my podcast, I was like, oh, what's going on? Because in the beginning, it was like just me. I, I wasn't doing interviews yeah. in the beginning. Like the first six episodes, yeah. I struggled because yeah. – I'm talking to nobody, right? Like you're looking at yourself at best or nobody. And so I, so I, I couldn't even like just bullet point it out. I tried to script it. And you know, when you script things, you, you tend to like, if you're, if you're not a constant writer, you probably skip words when you're writing because you're thinking it. Right. And so I did that and I tried to read it and I'm like, I'm like recording while reading. And I'm like, what the hell did I write? Like I'm missing words. So I don't remember. Yeah. Then I sound like I, I either don't speak English or I can't read, right? Like one or the other. So I have I have never gone back and listened to those first six episodes, but I'd probably cringe <laughs> if I did, right? <laughs> and so the reality is, it's like, it's okay. Like I'm not good at something. I accepted right. that and I just kept going, right? Yeah, so it's number almost like one, a rite of passage, right? Yeah, totally, 100%. So whatever you're thinking about doing, you may not be great, you may not be the expert, but that's okay. And everybody starts at that same point. Like nobody wake up, you know, like was born with like, whoo, this skill set, you know, like how, I, I know how to do whatever. So that's number one. Number two is I would say like, um, do, if this is going to be a side hustle or this is going to be your primary, like there's differences, but you know, everyone's always like, oh, do what you love. Like maybe, maybe not. Like if you're in the situation where you need to make money, it may take a lot longer time to do what you love to make money. And you have to either understand that or, or, you know, you know, be willing to trade that. So if you're like, okay, what should I do? 
excuse me, I think there's a number of things in today's environment that, you know, that weren't available like years ago in the sense that like you can learn a skill and the easiest thing to do is to kind of like learn a skill, hone the skill, and then basically you sell the skill. So, you know, whether you want to call yourself a done for you service, an agency, a contractor, a freelancer, whatever it is, you can go and let's say you want to learn Facebook ads. Let's say you want to learn how to sell on Amazon. Let's say figure whatever that thing is, right? Try and learn the skill. You learn the skill. You're like, I don't like the skill. Next, next skill. Okay. Learn the skill, like the skill now offer the skill. And again, depending on what you need, some people will tell you to work for free to get the testimonials and do the things. Sometimes that's okay, but sometimes you're like, no, I need to pay the bills, right? And right. so you go in and you find someone who's willing to pay you and you implement those skills. Now, a lot of times people are like, okay, now I have an agency and I'm, I'm going to grow this. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't because the reality is, is like building a business around you and a service is not a super simple thing. It, it's easy to make money, but it doesn't mean that like the business is going to scale very well. And, and like there's a lot of like pitfalls that people kind of run into, but that would be step one. Like the, the barrier to entry of like learning skills today is pretty low, you know, in the sense that like whether you want to pay for a course somewhere, whether you want to learn on YouTube, whether you listen to a podcast like this, there is so much information. I think like the statistics are something like we learn in a week what, you know, someone in the early 1900s learned more in, in a week than they did in their lifetime. Wow. You know, so information is definitely not at, at a minimum here, right? Like you can For get sure. a ton of information really, really quickly. And so I always tell people like have patience, especially younger people, like have the patience, learn the skill. No one's going to be a millionaire overnight. No one's going to get rich in, in a year. Like if you want to actually do something, you want to be able, build a business, like think about the things that you know or things that you want to know. And kind of use that skill to kind of like first learn the skill, then sell the skill. And then if you're like, okay, I can make it a side job, fine. I can make it a business, fine. And, you know, if, you, if you're like, hey, no, I want to get into physical products, again, it's a skill. You just have to learn some of these things and you can kind of get into it. But there are so many like open-endedness of that, but that would be just some of my, you know, like an initial takes on that. I thought one of your uh, takes, I think it may be from a podcast or in the email or whatever it was, but what an interesting take that you had on it is like knowing the direction of your business when you're starting it. Like if, do you want to scale and have it long term? Do you want to start a business and then flip that business and then start a new one? Or do you want it to be staying small and not scaling? And I think that's like interesting because everybody talks about maybe starting a business, but they don't necessarily ask the question of like what type of what's like the longevity of my business or what style of business do I want to have? And I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, no, that, that is, it, it's very funny because like, that is the thing I tell, like it, it's, it's exactly like, I, I know exactly what I even think it was like, it was in the podcast um, that it's just like personal finance and just like money, anything that you do, whether it's a business, whether it's your investing, whether it's whatever, you need some sort of end goal. Because without it, you're just kind of like going into like this abyss of like, un, you know, like uh, where's the ending thing, right? You don't know where the sidewalk ends and you're just going to like keep going, keep going, keep going. So if you have some kind of goal, like I actually literally had a call today and someone was talking about how they're growing their business. They're basically like a two, three million dollar a year business and their margins are amazing, like 80, 90 percent. And um, they're like, we just don't know what to do with all this extra money. And they're like, we don't know what, where to apply it to grow. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, I'm like, first question, like, why do you want to grow? Like, no one says you have to grow. You can grow. You, you totally can. There's nothing wrong with it. But going from like two, three million to 10 million is a lot of dark days in there. Like a lot of muddiness you got to get through. It's hard. And like a lot of the systems you built to get to two, three million, they're going to break because they're not d designed for the 10 million. It's kind of like, you know, sure. when you think about like the internet in the, when in the early stage, and now we have like this coax cable, right? So you have like, you know, Fios and all this stuff and like the speed at which information can flow. But historically it was like smaller pipes. And before that was DSL, before that was just the phone line, the fiber line. And it just couldn't fit all this stuff and, and we needed a bigger tube. It's the same with the business. Like you, just because you got to this point, it doesn't mean that you know, if you try and stuff more stuff, you know, revenue or business through that pipe that it was built for that and it's probably going to break. And so the question I asked this guy was like, well, do you want, like, why do you want to grow? Or you, you could have a very happy lifestyle 
on a two, $3 million, 80, 90% margin business mm-hmm. and like have a ton of free time. Like if you grow it to 10, it may take two X your time. Are you, do you want that? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to sell it? Do you, all these questions. Right. And, and so I think that's part of the thing. Like your, your goalposts can change, but you have to have like a, a North star, a goalpost to start with, like to kind of hit your end goal in investing in business in whatever. I was going to say that's pretty applicable across anything in life. Uh, when you really think about it, it's, you need to have that why to really push you forward, whether it is through investing, uh, business or even other life goals that you might have. And I think it's always important. And we talk about it on this podcast quite a bit is defining your why and making sure that you stay true to it. And obviously that can change from time to time and you just need to make sure that you're aware of that and make sure that, like you said, you have to build those foundations or their structures uh, to fit whatever that why is going forward. But let's turn it into the investing side, uh, REA. Uh, so obviously you are, you have worked for an investment management firm and you help clients with their money and finding opportunities and things like that. Uh, but what are some tips that you ha- might have for someone that's just getting started into investing? It can be very overwhelming for a lot of people. Uh, one, because it, it's a really hard world to get into um, if you don't have the background knowledge of the financial literacy, uh, you know, people throw in terms around at you all the time, even the most basic type of terms like 401ks, IRAs, index funds, things like that. What are some tips that you have for people that are brand new to the investing scene and how can they really start or how, how can they start uh, get started? Yeah. So I, I totally get that it can be overwhelming. And I find that like, as I talk to people, like I learn, Ooh, I have to take five steps backwards before I even start giving you what I thought was step one, right? Because based on your, your knowledge base. Um, so I think the first thing is get started. Okay. Don't get stuck in the analysis paralysis mode. And and this goes for business too, but more importantly with the finance, because in investing, time is your friend the earlier you start. And so the younger you start, the more you can afford to make mistakes. You can be aggressive. You can you can recover from, from those things later. So even if it's on a small basis, like getting started on a continuous basis. And what I mean by that is like a lot of these things are very automatable. In today's world, you can literally have it that you have an ACH pull. What that means is basically whether it's Fidelity, Schwab, even Robinhood or, you know, whatever app you want to use, they will pull money out of your bank account on a set day or weekly or monthly, whatever you want it to be, and in put it into that account. And they can automatically buy, less, let's say you want to just be buying the S&P 500, the index, right? So the S&P 500, people hear about, they're not sure what it is. All it is, is is a basket of the largest 500 companies in the United States. And instead of buying one company and investing in one company, you're basically investing in the 500 largest companies. What's the pro, what's the con? That is the benchmark. That is the the average that everybody says, okay, how am I doing relative to that? That's basically for United States equities, stocks, that is what people use as the comparable comparison. And statistically speaking, nine out of 10 other options underperform that. Now, I don't mean right. single, single companies, but I mean like other funds, whether mutual funds or exchange traded funds or anything like that. And so if nothing else, you will come out as the average if that is all you do. If you every month are buying the average, you'll be average. And you know what? The average is pretty okay over time, right? Like, you know, so that that's one thing they can do to start. You know, don't be afraid that like, oh, I need to analyze this and I need to analyze that. Just get it going. And the other thing is, is like get it going in an automatic way that you have to, you don't have to think about it too much as well as like you want it to be continuous. Like, so some people, like the scary thing is like, if someone says, Hey, I'm sitting on $10,000, I'm sitting on $50,000, what should I be doing? Like, you'll never be able to, nobody ever times the market top or the market bottom correctly. Like even the professionals, right? right? Like they get it, you know, they may get close, they may get wrong sometimes, whatever it is. But if you are what we call dollar cost averaging, if you average, if you buy in on a continuous basis, right? You're buying at the high, you're buying at the low, you're buying more at the low, you're buying more at the high, you're buying, you will come out right in the middle, right? You will, your average cost will come out in the middle. Time in the market will benefit you more than trying to time the market. And, and ultimately, that is something that anybody and everybody can do. And you don't have to do, like, you're like, hey, I don't really feel good about the S&P 500. You want to do with that Bitcoin? You want to do that with Bitcoin or Ethereum? There's so many platforms now that you can actually dollar cost average, you know, those types of things. If you're like, hey, I want to get into real estate, 
certain things are not really achievable when you only have like 500 or a thousand dollars but there are apps now that in platforms that are coming out that you can you know use a hundred dollars or five hundred dollars that you can start in these things or you can accumulate and start to actually get into real estate other ways you can buy REITs which are publicly traded stocks which are real estate investment trusts and so they are managing it like think of Simon Malls or any of these kinds of things right so there's a lot of different ways to do it but don't overanalyze it just get it going you can always change it you can always fix it, you know, and the other thing is, is like, you can make more. Like you'll, if you, if you somehow lose money, you will have the ability to make more. Like that is just a, a mental mind shift that I think a lot of people, you know, struggle with. Like, what if I do it wrong? What if I lose it? What if it all goes to zero? Right. And so that's why, like I tell people, okay, if you're, if that, if that is your biggest fear, start with the S&P 500 almost because like the odds of 500 companies going bankrupt um, are pretty, you know, low. Granted, we the world is a crazy place the last three years, and you know, right, we're yeah. living in a pretty crazy time now with the markets. But at the same time, like, just get it going, and you know, and have a long term horizon, you know, view on on things. One thing I I love about being able to invest nowadays is the fact that you can automate it, and you really don't have to think about it after you've set up that initial uh, system. And because a lot of people you hear from time to time saying, oh. I don't have the time. I, you know, I don't have the time to do the research. I don't have the time to actually go into these apps and invest, or I don't want to make the time. Maybe is a more, there is a better way to phrase it. Um, but the fact now that you can really just set this up once, and then you can just have it in perpetuity to pull from your account, you know, whatever it is, if it's weekly, monthly, or whatever, and you can invest into whatever funds you want in such an easy manner, I think is a huge, huge win for people to now start investing and to continue to invest, even if they are brand new to the investing scene. Uh, so Ari, one question I have for you uh, that I, I saw uh, you talk about or mentioned um, is, you know, does the 401k, does that still make sense for people to still use in today's day and age? Yeah. So I think um, it's obviously a loaded question and I will give like some legal disclaimer, right? This is not financial advice. But um, from that perspective, um, if you're an employee, okay, and you are working at a company and they offer you a 401k, there are pros and cons to the 401k and you just need to first and foremost understand them. So first, does your company offer you any sort of match? What that means is if you put a dollar in, do they put 50 cents in for you? Do they put in 30 cents for you? Do they put in no cents for you? Right? And you know, I would say a standard corporate match to these days looks something like the the following. And of course, this is not simple. Like of course, they could make it simple, but they don't. It, they say if you put in 6% on your first 6% that you put in, we will match 3%. What that really means in English is if you make $100,000 and you want to put in 6% on the first six that you put in, we will put in three. Okay. Now, in that scenario, what you are doing is you are getting a 50% return on your first $6,000. So yeah, that makes a ton of sense to use because you are making 50% return before the market does anything. Whether it goes up or whether it goes down, you are making money. Okay. If they don't have a match, okay, so let's keep it simple and they, they're offering you this opportunity, okay, first and foremost, know yourself. If you do not use the 401k, are you going to put the money into investments and have it grow? And if the answer is, ah, oh, maybe sort, no, then the answer is definitely no. You are not going to do it and you should use the <laughs> right. 401k, <laughs> yep. right? Like if, if it's not a hell yeah, yeah. then it's probably a no and you probably should just take the money and put it in the 401k. Now, right. investing somewhere is better than investing nowhere. Yeah. So, so the challenge, so the, the pros to the 401k, right, is that depending on your, on your company's plan, it's either tax deferred or tax, uh, tax now and exempt. And the difference is whether they have a 401k that's a Roth or a 401k that's a traditional. Yep. Most companies use a traditional, but some have flexibility around these things. And the big thing to know is let's go with a traditional 401k. So it's tax deferred. What does that mean? If I take, and, and you're capped at like $19,500, I think is the 2021 number. So basically you can take $19,500 of your salary on a pre-tax basis. So you get paid it without taxes and it goes into this vehicle. So number one, tax deferred, you lower your taxable income. Fine. It will grow without paying taxes on it 
But when you do take the money out, you will pay taxes on all of it because you never pay taxes on any of it. Question number one, will tax taxes be lower in the future? Mm, probably not. But let's mm-hmm. you know assume like that to be static and, and it, let's assume it's the same. The challenge with the 401k is, number one, you cannot touch it till you're 59 and a half without paying some penalty on that money. So understand that the money you're putting away, it is for your future, but it is for the, let's call it classical retirement age, right? Like right. if you want to travel in 10 years, if, if you're 25 years old and, and in 10 years from now you want to travel the world, that money is pretty untouchable unless you want to pay a 10% penalty to the government. Okay, mm-hmm. So that's item number one. That's not even the, like the biggest quote unquote problem. The bigger problem is that while you are employed, your investment options are limited to what your employer has put in this plan for you. Now, it may have great options. It may not. But you have to actually start to look at that and say, oh, are these funds good? Are these funds not good? What are the fees on these funds? Am I paying like an administrative fee? Right. And I'm not telling you like not to invest in the 401k. I'm telling you to get educated. I'm telling yep. you to actually understand the limitations of the plan. But at the same time, it comes with a pro. And that is like, I would say the average person does not take the money. If they don't put it in the 401k, they end up spending it. Mm-hmm. And they don't end up investing it. Right. And so for that person, like, yeah, it's pretty important to do because like, unfortunately I've known too many people, you know, they turn around, they're 35, they're 45, they're 55, they're 65, and they've really saved and invested like nothing. And it's, it's a crappy, crappy situation to be in where you're like, oh my God, I lost all these years because you've had, you could have had compounding growth. Right. So even if you like, I don't I don't know the math off the top of my head, but I think like basically like if someone invests like from 25 to 35, let's say whatever the the amount is, and then they just stop at 35 and their buddy doesn't invest until 35 and they invest from, let's say, you know, 35 to 55 there the likelihood is, is the person who invested from 25 to 35, when they're both 60 or whatever it is, that person who invested from 25 to 35, even though he stopped in, in, you know, 35, at 35 years old, and he, he did 10 years less than the second person, he should end up with more money depending on the returns. Obviously like the returns is a, is a huge component of that, but it's the time value there. The return with time value you know, compound interest is just like that magic thing, right? There's right. a saying that like, you know, people claim that Albert Einstein says it's the eighth wonder of the world. I've researched it. He has never said that. He <laughs> he did he did say those who learn compound interest will benefit and those who don't will pay it. Something to that effect. Oh, I'm, sure. I'm misquoting it. But it has never been quoted, you know, proven that he said that. But conceptually though, there's there's power in compounding. And so that's why that 25 to 35 year old person in that time, 10 years, because then they're just going to get another 20 plus years of growth on it. Mm-hmm. They, they have that benefit because I think, I think if you look at Warren Buffett's wealth, they showed, right? Like what he made in the last 10 years is probably double or triple what he made in the first 20 or 30 years or whatever it is. And the, or the prior 20 or 30. And that's because the base is just compounding. Like it's simple math that like it think of it as like the snowball rolling down that hill right like the surface area just continues to expand and it's accumulating more and more snow because it's simply just uh, it's touching more snow as it continues to roll down the hill and it's it's hard though for people right because it takes that time it takes decades for that snowball to really build up to be where you know you're starting to see huge movements and interest um, over time but let's bring it back to the 401k you're totally right in the sense that your 401k you know if you look at two 401ks that have both have, let's just say an S and P index fund or ETF, you could be paying twice for one fund over the other. So there definitely are differences uh, between plans. And so, like you said, you have to get educated around exactly what your plan offers and all the nuances of it. But what would you say if someone didn't have very good options in their 401k and had the ability to say, I'm not going to put it here um, again, after the match because we're going to take the match because free money is better than you know guaranteed money is better than putting it elsewhere uh but after you get the match what would you say is a really good spot to put your money if not in a 401k i think the question becomes what is your personal plan from the perspective of are you going to want to use this money now or later meaning 
no one's using it now. I mean, more of like in the next five to 15 years or, and, and uh, what age are you? Right. Right. Um, or because like, if you're already like 45 years old, might as well put it in there because yeah. you'll get, you'll get the, the benefit and you're only like 15 years away from being able to kind of pull it out. Right. So if you're, if you're on the younger side and you're like, okay, I'm going to put in the m- amount first to get the match. And then the excess above that, it's becomes a function of like, okay, where do you where do you want to be going in the sense of like do you like the concept of crypto right so some people i found are really really into it right kind of like the nfts and then some people are really really afraid of it or they really really think like this is just one big scam so knowing your risk tolerance of like hey i want to try and tedx my money versus i want to take like normal investment return type of things you can that person can go stick it in the 401k but otherwise you could put it in in a taxable account as well now understanding like hey you will be paying taxes on your gains but you'll have unlimited investment opportunities Mm -hmm. you can start to put it in you know the market's changed a little bit like as we talk here in march of 2022 that stable coins which is a component of the crypto market there's a lot of places that you can actually earn real return in today's market, you know, call it seven to ten percent in a pretty riskless manner, just using something called a stable coin. Yep. And there's different platforms to do this. And you could build the cash while it's growing and then say, okay, I want to put it into a syndicated real estate deal. Right. So you kind of like grow it to let's say twenty five thousand, fifty thousand, and now you put it into a two hundred unit complex, apartment mm-hmm. complex, and you could do that. But if you put it in that four hundred one K, you wouldn't be able to. Right. Sure. At the same time, if you plan on leaving a company anytime in the near future that you have it, when you move, but when you leave that company, you can roll the 401k into um, a traditional or Roth IRA, depending on what, whatever it is. If it's a, it's a traditional 401k, it becomes a traditional IRA. If it's a Roth 401k, it becomes a, uh, a Roth um, IRA. But you can also roll it into something called like a, a self-directed for your IRA. Mm -hmm. And, and so then you can invest in crypto and then you can invest in real estate in that vehicle, but it can't be at the employer. The employer vehicle is limited to the plan. The second you leave, you can port it and roll it over somewhere. A little bit of paperwork. It's not rocket science. That's for sure. But now you can, you can do these things and you can say, Hey, I want to invest in real estate via this vehicle and what have you. So again, kind of need to know your personal game plan a little bit, but there's a lot of things you could do. There's obviously there's a taxable component to it, but long term, that may be in your best interest anyway. So it really sounds like flexibility or personal interest is really the main question here is when are you using it? Is it going to be used for retirement or, or do you want to invest in other things like, uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, real estate, and that's really dependent on where you're going to invest at the end of the day. And I think, Drew, that's something that we talk about all the time, too, is, you know, personal finance is personal. And the fact that you really need to decide what your financial plan is to really decide where you're going to invest the money. Uh, but I think one of yeah. the big takeaways I, there is always take that employer match because that's just free money. And, you know, it kind of goes back to even to what we were saying earlier in the episode is you have to have that goal pulse. You have to have that endpoint. You have to understand what you want to do with your money and uh as Ari Ari said like to to educate yourself on the 401k or other investment investment vehicles I think is extremely important because then you have you know the option to look around and see what else is actually out there so Ari we like to ask our guests uh this question you know it's not so much financial soundness uh but it is something that gives our guests or our listeners a better in, look into our guests you know you here today and uh, you know that is what is your financial vice or your financial guilty pleasure so what is that one thing looking back that you may buy from time to time even if it might make you feel guilty you know some examples that we've heard in the past is things that were like i really like to go on vacation and spend money there because i like to get the experience me personally i enjoy collecting video games um but Ari, Ari, what what exactly would be your financial vice I, I thought about this because I, I don't really 
I wouldn't say frivolously. Like I, I just, I don't like spend a lot of money here and there, but like, I do like to be educated. So I do spend money like on either courses or books, but I thought about this after like, I kind of, that was like my initial thought. Cause that's probably where I spend the bulk of my money. But I did think about this and I realized that, and I'm trying to remember when it started. It did, it definitely didn't start when I was young, but my wife and I, we tend to once a year, we try and go away just the two of us on anywhere from like a three to 10 day vacation, uh, even two weeks. And I, I'm trying to remember how many years ago we started doing this, but once we started that trip, so I, I happen to like vacation. I don't necessarily love to travel the world. That's not me. My wife likes to travel more. Okay. I like to see, I, I happen to think in the United States there are so many really cool and nice places and great views and hikes and all those different things. But when we travel, when we do that, uh, we have come to the point where traveling in, let's call it luxury, right? It makes the experience tremendously different. So sure. when, we, when I go to the hotel, there's a huge difference between going to whatever the Holiday Inn Express and staying at the Ritz or staying yeah. at the St. Regis or staying at, you know, you know, I'm trying to remember what the, the Banyan Tree where we stayed at in, in um, Mike Coba in, in Mexico. Like the level is just, it's, it's huge. And so that's probably like the thing when we travel, it's once a year, it's just the two of us. It's like, okay, we're going to, we'll, we'll spend there. And I uh, like, I guess that's the vice. That's a great one. I've heard that from a, a, one other person too. They talked about how when they travel, because they only do it annually, they like to f- travel first class. They like to get, you know, a nice hotel room. They like to uh, go out to eat and have a nicer, higher end dinner. And the experience of that is second to none when you look at how most people probably travel, like myself included. I like to travel and for the most part, as cheap as I possibly can. Um, but, you know, th- those experiences are just so different uh, between yeah. each other. I, I would say, like, um, if you look at my on my Instagram stories, I think I even have, like, our Italy trip um, is still, like, one of the highlight things. Yeah. And that trip was not just, like, it was an amazing trip and it was over 10 to 14 days. But that trip, we even hired a, a person to design our, our, ten, our, our itinerary. Okay. Because like the idea for me, the idea of having to plan the trip is like not just like annoying. It's like almost like ugh, painstaking. It almost makes me not want <laughs> yeah. to do the trip, right? Yeah. And so like we paid to have someone do that. And like at first I was like not only not not just like embarrassed. I was like, but that that sounds ridiculous. Why am I gonna pay someone to do this? <laughs> and then my wife's like, Are you gonna plan the plan where we're gonna go and how we're gonna go yep. and where we're gonna stay? And I'm like heck no you're right like whatever <laughs> like you always say your time's valuable so you have so to, put you, that to put you on the spot what has been your favorite trip that you've been on looking back Whew. um all right so i think so we stayed at uh the saint regis in puerto rico and i don't know that since the hurricanes years ago if they've reopened but the saint regis in bahia beach um was an amazing resort and so what I really liked about that place, like, you know, the Banyan tree in, in Mayakoba was amazing. Like that was like the most gorgeous because you have your private pool off of your like living room in your villa. It, it was like amazing. Wow. But, but, um, the, the Bayou beach was really cool because they have two miles of private beach. So unless you're at this resort, the, the, the beach is closed to anyone. Oh, that's really nice. But your room didn't, none of the rooms overlooked the water directly. It was kind of like, but it was this big resort. So they had a golf course, but more importantly, like we, that was the first time we went paddle boarding because they have like a, a lake. So you can kind of like, you don't have to go on the ocean to do it. Like, so first you did it in the lake, they had tennis courts, they had bikes for you. So it was just like an all in resort. Plus they had pools and, and the beach and all this stuff. And yeah. like, so all in all, that was probably like, I, I think, you know, one of the best trips. That sounds fantastic. I am super really jealous awesome. of that. <laughs> uh, so I might just Aria, like Aria. look it up, just let's see pictures yeah. of it. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast here today. We do got one final question for you. Um, each and every week, Drew and I share with our listeners what's going on in the neighborhood as really just a way for us to share what's going on in our lives as a little glimpse into who we are. Uh, More often than not, we're not talking about personal finance and we're talking about really just anything under the sun. Like Drew right now is spending his time in Florida in the sunshine. Uh, So, so Aria. Not the normal studio. (laughs) I got a bathroom door behind me. (laughs) (laughs) 
So Aria, what what's going on over in your neighborhood? Where can people go and look up where you're out on the internet? Yeah, sure. So I mean, I think what's going on in my my personal neighborhood, like I, I have four kids, my wife and I, um, and so my second child is going to graduate high school this year. Um, awesome. And awesome. so like he's just gotten into all the you know programs he wanted to for next year, and it's been like we're really proud of him. He's yeah. been the hard work. Um, you know, and I I have for many many years like I've coached their you know their different like flag football and stuff like that. But you know now that they both play JV, my, my two boys are in high school, and one plays JV, one plays varsity basketball. Like the these last couple of years, like now that you know kind of COVID you know, restrictions have been down. Like this year, I've just gone to like a ton of games and, and mm, nice. you know, tournaments for them. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, what else is going on? I think last year I launched a course uh, called Future Fund. So you can head over to futurefundme.com. And that's really like a very good, I, w- I wouldn't say like beginner guides because it's beyond beginner, but it, it also gives you the foundations of, we talked about like North Star and, and things of that nature. I think a lot of people like who love finance, they want to learn everything, but the other people are like a little bit concerned. They're like, they, they want to put their head in the sand. They want to avoid it. That course really kind of like takes a lot of the anxiety and the concerns away. First breaks it down to kind of set up your goal post, kind of have you understand where you want to potentially want to go, how to get there, which is I think a lot of people's challenge. And then I really kind of at a high level go through every asset class and try and teach you kind of how to do these things. It comes with spreadsheets and all this stuff so that you can actually kind of track some of the stuff. And there's even some software that I have made for it. Um, okay. And so that's, I started that last year and it's gone really well. The feedback's been great. People have like really connected with it. Um, and then on social media, like, you know, I think my main platform is Instagram, which is REA, the businessman. And I'd say in the last six months I started really ramping up a little bit, getting more onto Twitter. So that's just REA Shinebine. Well, I got to admit, coming out of that conversation with REA, I was just so fired up. You know, there were so many things in there that he talked about that just got me re-energized to continue doing this podcast and really talk about all of the stuff that we have been doing so far. So coming out of that conversation, I really have three main takeaways. One, If you're getting into business or if you're going down the entrepreneurial journey, just get going. You you don't necessarily have to have everything figured out. And actually, if you look at these big time entrepreneurs, at one point in time, they also had some self-doubt. And just know that that's a natural part of the process and and just get going. I know if I think about this podcast that Drew and I have started there was quite a bit of self-doubt at the very beginning of, you know, how do we actually get a podcast going? You know, what are the steps we need to take? And there's just so much to think of up front that it can be a real roadblock for people, for us even to get started. But just getting started and learning as you go, I think is, is so important, whether it's in business, whether it's in your own job or it's in, you know, whatever type of thing that or goal that you want to achieve in, in life. So then my number two, my second key takeaway is more on the investing side. Just get started. You don't have to be an expert. I love that REA talks about that. You know, it can be so easy now investing. You can just simply put your money into an S&P 500 index, which basically, like REA said, is just the benchmark. It's the average. It's what everybody tries to be it when investing. And that's actually what I personally do. I'm a huge fan of the S&P 500 indexes that exist out there, or ETFs for, for that matter. But you know, if it does worry you, if it does scare you about investing, just get started. I love that REA talked about, you know, if you make a mistake, you can always make more money. And specifically, if you start younger, you've got so much time to make up for that lost money, for those mistakes. And honestly, at the end of the day, making mistakes with your money is truly the only way to grow. You're never going to know everything when you start anything. So just get started decide what your plan is if you're saving for your retirement, if you're saving for something maybe that's before 59 and a half or when these type of retirement accounts would actually allow you to take this money. 
make that decision, and then just get started into whether it's an S&P 500 index fund or not. And then I think my third key takeaway of the conversation, and he talked about it a couple of times, but really focusing in on the fact that if you have a passion, follow it. And you know, you might have to make the decision of, okay, well, I want to start this business above something I really love, but it's going to take me some time to actually get it up to making money. And that's okay. You can always get a job to pay the bills and you just have to be self-aware of, you know, is this something that I really love to do? And is this something worth pursuing? And I think REA and his baseball card hobby that ultimately turned into a side hustle that ultimately turned into paying for a down payment on his house is a real testament to that. And the fact that you don't have to just forego something that you want to actually create. You don't have to forego something that you're passionate about just because money is an issue. You can always get a job and do this on the side and really just build it up over time. And, you know, I, I there's so many other things that I could pull out of this conversation with REA, but hopefully you guys found a lot of value from it because I know I did. Woo! Do you hate budgeting? Do you hate having to track every single expense when trying to budget? Well, if that sounds like you, Here's a budget that you could consider putting into your financial plan. It's called the 50 20 30 budget. Here's how it breaks down 50% of your income goes towards your necessary expenses like rent, mortgage, utilities. 20% goes towards saving and investing. And then the 30% that's left over goes towards your flexible spending. These are things like gas, groceries, drinks, going out to eat, vacations, whatever you really want it to be at the end of the day. And that's it. No more keeping detailed records of every single expense that you spend throughout the entire month. As long as you keep your necessary expenses under 50%, keeping your savings and investing to 20% or more, and then just spending the rest on however you see fit. And that's this week's Money Minute. All right, guys, like I said, it's just me here in the neighborhood this week. So I thought I would just sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one chat with you about all the craziness that's going on in our world right now. You know, we've got inflation running rampant. There's a war in Ukraine. Who knows where that's going to lead to? Stock markets are down, so your retirement accounts are probably following suit. There's just so much going on right now, and there's so much uncertainty that I said, hey, you know what? Here's a really good time for me just to, one, share with you what's going on, what are some things you could consider, but two, talk about what I'm doing, what my family is doing to really approach this place of uncertainty so maybe you can follow suit and maybe have a little less uneasiness trying to manage through the next couple of weeks, the next couple of months, or, or however long all of this lasts. So let's talk about inflation. At the end of the day, and what inflation means is just that living is more expensive. You're spending more money on groceries. You're spending more money on gas. You're just spending more money on those necessary expenses meaning you have less discretionary income at the end of the month to buy things that you want or you might have less money to save and invest for the long term. Now, this is so important in times like this is that you want to always make sure that regardless of the environment that we're currently experiencing, that you continue to follow your financial plan, that you continue to save and invest for those long-term goals, whether that's retirement or something else. Don't make a specific environment make you not think clearly and change things up just because maybe you heard something from someone on the TV or maybe you have a little fear. And that's okay. Fear is normal in this type of environment, but make sure you stick to your plan. Now, here's one thing that my family is doing that you might be able to consider is when you're going grocery shopping, when you're driving your car needing gas, are there places, are there areas that you can cut back on. And I don't mean completely deprive yourself of going somewhere, you know, to see a friend or maybe or going out to eat to get together with someone that you haven't seen for a long time. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, are there things when you're going grocery shopping that you can cut back on, right? Are there some, we'll call them luxury items if you can call a grocery uh, or food, a luxury item. Are there some things that you can cut back on? Can you find some substitutes that might be a little bit cheaper? Are there a is there a different grocery store that offers the same type of food, but at a cheaper Aldi? Great example. Now with driving, do you need to go on the, the, 
the trips or do you need to use your car as often as you might in a typical environment? Is there a places where you can just, hey, step back and say, you know what, I don't actually need to go here. I can save on the gas. Because at the end of the day, what that's going to do, it's going to open up your your discretionary income is going to allow you to continue to save and invest for the long term uh, for the long term. And that is so important in this environment. So number two, fully funding your emergency fund is always important, but it's even more important when you're in times of uncertainty. Who knows what's going to happen with the war in Ukraine? Who knows how widespread is going to impact the world, going to impact the United States here. So making sure that your emergency fund is fully funded, whether that's three, six, 12 months, whatever you want. And maybe maybe if you choose to have a three, three month emergency fund, maybe you beef that up a little bit, but having that fully funded emergency fund right now is so important because with the uncertainty, we just don't know what's going to happen. And so having that little extra cash to get you through a couple extra weeks of whether it's rising prices or maybe, you know, you get, you, you, you know, worst case in our scenario, you lose your job, whatever it might be, having that fully funded emergency fund to get you through whatever the situation is, is so important. And then number three, obviously there's a lot here to cover, but number three, the stock market, the equity markets are down. They are dropping. Uh, cryptocurrencies are dropping. So whatever you more than likely you're investing in is dropping just because of the current state of the economy. So what that typically leads to is fear, leads to doubt, leads to uncertainty when continuing to invest. But you can't think of it that way. You got to stay true to your financial plan, to whatever your investment policy is. If you've been investing every two weeks, continue to invest every two weeks into the assets that you bought before all of this craziness happened. And that's exactly what we're doing. Actually, we're doubling down. We're putting more money into our investments because we know right now that whether it's a correction or whether we drop even further into a bear market, which is just a 20% drop from the high of, let's just say the S&P 500 or whatever investment you are, we're doubling down because we know the long-term, our long-term investments, the outlook of our investments are positive. We believe in them. That's why we invested in them before and we're going to continue to invest in them in the future. So right now, even though there's so even though there's so much uncertainty with investing with the stock market, we're continuing to invest every two weeks. We're continuing to invest more of if if we can find extra money at the end of the month, we're throwing it into what into the assets that we chose before all this craziness because we believe in the long term of them. And we believe that we're going to bounce back and we're going to be better off in the future. So at the end of the day, what can you do with the craziness of everything? It's, are there spots to cut back? Can you pull back just a little bit to free up a little extra room? Making sure that your emergency fund is fully funded. And then, you know, the biggest thing I think is making sure that you stick to your financial plan, making sure that you continue to go towards those long term goals, whether it's retirement or something else. Make sure that you stick with it, even in these on these times of uncertainty. Cause like Drew and I have talked about before, stocks have dropped meaning that you more than likely are buying at a discount. And over the long term, if you truly believe in the asset, if you believe in them before they dropped, you should believe in them when they dropped. And hopefully, and as we go into the future and the markets bounce back, you're going to be better off for it. So, you know, that's just some of my thoughts. Hopefully it provides you some some things to think about and just to be aware of as we continue to go through what, you know, this mess of uh, the Ukraine war, the inf- the inflation here in the United States and all that stuff. If, if you like this episode and if you want to see more episodes like that, let us know. Um, we always welcome topic ideas. Uh, if you have any topic ideas, please reach out to us on Instagram. That's the best way to get at us, direct message us there, and we'll pull together an episode around whatever topic you want to hear. We love the feedback and we it, you know, make sure that we're providing you, the listener, what you guys want to hear about. And anything is fair game, so please let us know. So thank you guys so much for listening to the Neighborhood Money Podcast this week. If you're watching us out on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. That helps us out a ton. 
ton. And actually, if you can hit the like button, that helps us out even more. If you're listening to us out on Apple, please leave us a review in the App Store. That actually helps us a ton and it helps us get our message out to more and more people. But guys, thank you so much for listening this week and for listening to our conversation with Arya Scheinbein. It was so great having him on the podcast. And you know, like I said earlier, he brings such a wealth of knowledge. He brings so much to the table. And quite frankly, his story about baseball cards and how he was able to flip it so that he could buy or put a down payment on his house for his wife. Pretty fascinating. All right, guys, we will see you guys next week in the neighborhood.